Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Jimmy Barada and Paul DeWallaby, who are hosts of the Business of Esports Podcast. Uh, we're going to give a lot of nuggets of wisdom on how to start your own podcast and also go deep into some debate on esports topics. Let's talk to Paul and Jimmy. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the, the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome Paul DeWallaby, the prophet, and Jimmy Barada of the Business of Esports Podcast. Thank you for joining me, guys. Thanks for having us, John. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. You know, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. I know a lot of people have. And so this is a really cool um, moment for me because there's those moments where you look up to somebody, you've enjoyed the content, and then to have them join you and be a part of your content is super cool. So I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to dig into some insights around podcasting. I know there's a lot of content creators there in the audience who would love to learn from you. Um, and also, of course, your takes and your experience in esports. So uh, before we get started, uh, Paul or Jimmy, why don't you kick it off, off for us? Tell us a little bit about you know your media network that's growing and what the esports podcast is all about. Sure, John, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take this. I, I mean, we, when I started the business of esports, it was really... Um, more out of out of necessity, right? I knew as part of my my bigger ambitions in the gaming industry that uh, having a media outlet, having an audience, was important to the other things I was going to be building in the space. And when I looked at sort of the media landscape, there was uh, a, I think a serious at the time. And this would have been almost three years ago now, a very serious lack of sort of anyone covering business content in the gaming space with some kind of authority. Mm. And, and what I mean by that was there were, you know, there were journalists who had things like the Esports Observer and the Esports Insider, but fundamentally it was journalists talking about business and, and they really didn't know what they were talking about. I mean, there was, you know, they could write the story, but there was no insight. There was no analysis. There was nothing that sort of dug into what this meant for the industry and why people should care. And yeah. so that was really the genesis of Business of Esports was... Um, felt that there was a need for business content, you know, deep insight, deep analysis, sort of interviews, uh, covering the news, all those good things, uh, but coming from a place of authority and, you know, uh, someone who's been building companies or in and around the tech and gaming space for the last 20 years. So that, that was the genesis of business of esports, And, um, you know, the media empire call it has grown into other things we're doing other podcasts now like meta business and meta woman and, you know, covering a lot of metaverse themes. So broader blockchain, crypto gaming, and how all these things intersect, but uh, business of esports remains obviously our biggest show and, and where it all started. Right on. And then how Jimmy, uh, what was your introduction into the business of esports podcast and how'd you get involved with Paul? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I was an attorney for about seven years and I left in 2017, 2018 to pursue a, a career in gaming and in esports. Uh, I got connected to Paul actually through a mutual friend of ours and uh, and he was kind enough to offer me his time, even though I was 30 minutes late to the meeting because we mixed up the time zone with Paul being in New York. <laughs> I, I got this call. It was great first impression, right? I got this call like, uh, are we still doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, for for the next uh, few years uh, and what I always tell students in my in my esports course at UC Irvine, I say, you got to stay in front of these people because it's more about timing than anything else. So I kept sending Paul um, projects that I was involved in, uh, things that I was looking at or, or doing. And then eventually uh, I kind of forced him to hire me where I just became, I think, hopefully uh, too much to ignore and, and had uh, finally accumulated that experience under my belt. And again, it was timing where uh, the business of esports and holodeck in general were really taking off. So I kind of tricked Paul into thinking that I could take a lot of work off his plate and help him out. But uh, as we're growing and, and, and wheeling and dealing, so to speak, I think I'm giving him uh, a lot more than, than he expected, but it's a good thing. 
So you are, you started out saying, let me give you some uh, free you up, give you some billable time. And then now you're joining him on the podcast. So who's doing all the work while you guys are uh, together on camera? I, I mean, John, I'm just the face of it. I, the, I, it really is, you know, Holodeck has, and it's really led by Jimmy, has an incredible team of, you know, production people and writers and editors and videographers. And, you know, I have a great co-host in Jimmy on the podcast. I have a great co-host in Jeff Cohen on the Meta Business podcast. Um, you know, I, I, I think where my, my genius, if you want to call it that, is I just hire people smarter than me and they do most of the work. I've heard that's the best way to do it. In fact, <laughs> I, I used to work for somebody and, and tease him all the time. I was like, you know, you're such a great boss because you hired somebody smarter than you, meaning me. He didn't really like that joke. That <laughs> the DLC Drop podcast is sponsored by iShaker. I've been a huge fan of this brand for the past few years, ever since I met founder Chris Gronkowski. Uh, what I love about this product is the brand story, the functionality, and the customization iShaker is a Shark Tank company invested in by Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez, owned by NFL players Rob Gronkowski and Chris Gronkowski. I love using my iShaker anytime I'm driving to the podcast studio, I'm going skateboarding, or I'm at the gym. No matter what I'm doing, it just does a great job of keeping my drinks hot or cold. The customization for iShaker is something that's super unique. You can get any name, just about any logo engraved onto your iShaker and delivered to you within just three to five business days. Get your own DLC Drop branded iShaker at iShaker.com forward slash DLC Drop. Save 20% on all iShaker products with the discount code DLC Drop. Um, question for you guys, because you know the way that I got into podcasting, I kind of stumbled into it uh, personally. Um, I, I got on a couple podcasts, uh, fortunate to have a unique career path uh, and um, experience in a vibrant category, of course. And so people tend to enjoy hearing my story and I like telling it. Um, but I never thought I would host a podcast. Uh, I was a guest on a bunch of them. Uh, this network uh, was very kind in offering me the opportunity to do a show. Uh, for question for both of you, have you had a goal to be a content creator or a podcast host that's been long term that you've worked towards, or is this something that you just kind of stumbled on and the the door opened and you walked through it? I'll, I'll go with go that ahead. one. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was specifically a podcast uh, goal of mine, but even in high school, and in, I think every group of friends has this conversation at some point because you kind of just spend a lot of your time hanging out, talking, right? Uh, sharing your favorite records or, or, you know, albums and comparing against that artist's, uh, their, their entire discography and library. And at some point, you know, in high school and in college, you know, we would always joke and say, we just need a talk show. Right. Uh, and I think that's a common vein thing that a lot of people probably think about that. Whatever you say is that interesting. Um, <laughs> right. but, but then when you put the resources behind it, right. When you put the, the schedule and the regularity, when you have, uh, amazing guests as, as you have, John and as you know we we hope and and, and often get um I, I think you can then build something around it I would would love to hear Paul's thoughts on this because he's the one that that really I mean business of esports was doing so great before I ever joined up so I'm just lucky to to benefit off of all that uh, work ethic and effort um John, I think, you know, my point of view has always been, I want to be the richest person no one's ever heard of. So, you know, did, did I have ambition to be a content creator? No, not really. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we run the media business as a business and its goal is to make money and um, creating content's a lot of fun, but uh, has to be a viable business. Otherwise you end up like, you know, Venn or, or some of these other outlets that have, that have failed. Um, I think for me, it started, it's not, this is not new for me. Um, I've been, you know, my backgrounds as a venture capitalist and uh, I humbly say I was, I was probably one of the first VCs other than like Fred Wilson in the U S um, who started, you know, blogging uh, in the mid and late two thousands, mid two thousands, hmm. when at, at the time VCs were not, they were, they were not seen, right. They were behind the scenes. Right. They were the, the money sort of operating in the background this was not a public job. Um, I, I would argue Fred and I uh, really pioneered sort of the more public facing VC, the blogging VC, the speaking VC, the person who put themselves out there. 
with a purpose, right? It was to get deal floats so that entrepreneurs would come to you. But I'd been blogging, you know, throughout the 2000s. I had been putting myself out there creating content. Uh, this, at, you know, at that stage, it was more VC and tech kind of content. But um, that wasn't new to me. And I think it was an easy transition to do that for the gaming and esports world uh, because it's something that I had done years and years before. I love that. Now, Paul, to follow up on that, uh, what is the difference between uh, a couple guys who have some opinions or are opinionated, uh, like to talk about the news, and what's a, a valid show that people are going to tune into, subscribe to, and you know, sponsors are going to contribute to as well? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's like the, that's somewhat of a subjective, like the, that, that view is subjective, right? Everyone's going to have a different view on what makes a legitimate show or a show that people want to tune into. Yeah. I think we hear in the gaming and esports world, and I, you know, I said this at a conference once, and I think I got a lot of, uh, not, not a lot of flack, but I, th I got a lot of people talking about this, which is, you know, everyone talks about authenticity. The content needs to be authentic. The host needs to be authentic, right? Yeah, we all yeah. need to be authentic. And I, I just think that's wrong. It's like, and I'm not okay. saying the content needs to be inauthentic because it does, but to me, that's a given. Right. Yeah. Like if it's not authentic, forget about it. Right. Like then you're just, you're fake and you shouldn't be creating content. Um, for me, it's so much more. And I used it in my intro. It's about authority. It's, are you the person that's going to educate me or entertain me in some way? And do you have authority? And when I say authority, it's really deep knowledge or experience mm -hmm. in that space. Right. Are you coming from a place where you're imparting some kind of wisdom that I can't get elsewhere? And Again, I, I, I humbly think that, you know, my 20 years as a VC and building tech companies and the track record I've got gives me some authority to speak on the business side of the industry and, and probably about most businesses in general. Um, and I think that's the key to success. That's, that's why people tune in. That's why, you know, we joke about it, but we have this thing about, you know, my prophecies and the prophet was right. Like, I'm not a genius. The reason I'm right is it's 20 years of experience, having seen these trends, having seen these life cycles, having seen, sure. you know, the same patterns over and over and over and over again, you end up just noticing them. Right. And so when you see something happening in the gaming industry and you go, Hey, you know, those Venn guys, that Venn company, that's not going to work out. I know it. I see it. Right. It's sure. not because I'm some genius that I saw that happening two years before anyone else. I just saw the pattern. Yeah. And I think speaking with authority is what makes, at least the content we make um, special. Absolutely, you know, um, a, a part, uh, this is for you, Jimmy, uh, a lot of people who I talk to uh, inside and outside of this podcast are trying to figure out how to get into esports. And I think what's uh, a really interesting dynamic in the space right now is you got a lot of uh, young people who understand culture, understand gaming, you know, they're innovative, they're energetic, they're young, but they don't have a lot of professional business experience and then you have on the other side you have a bunch of people who have professional business experience but they don't know the, the first thing about gaming and you can have two groups of people who are trying to get in this space you starting with your career as a lawyer uh what and now you're obviously a content creator here in the space you're doing all sorts of things with paul what would be your advice for people who are coming from basically a non-endemic background to get in this space no, I appreciate the question. It's it's loaded, and honestly, we could probably spend the rest of the show <laughs> sharing ideas, the it's three a great of us. Um, and I remember when Paul, before you hired me, uh, Paul interviewed me on the business of esports because I had just invested in XSet. I had just uh, started teaching at UC Irvine for esports, and uh, and we kind of shaped that episode, if you recall, Paul, around uh, advice, right, to switching careers or to starting a new uh, a, a new field in, in gaming and in esports. And I will say also, you know, half of my students that I teach, uh, half of them are in college. The other half are existing or have existing careers. They're working professionals. They see the value in gaming and in esports, and they're trying to, uh, you know, incorporate some type of gaming vertical to their company. Um, you know, again, lo loaded question, great question. I think it starts with adding value, right? No matter where you are, you have to figure out how you can help those that, that you work with and those that, uh, or rather those that you want to work with. Um, kind of a hard thing because it's really subjective also to where the listener uh, 
you know, is in their life and in their path. Some of them are in school and maybe they can afford to do a, a non-paid internship and get that uh, initial experience. Yeah. Some of them, like I said, are, are working and maybe they have, uh, they're taking uh, a business course uh, through a, you know, offer through a college uh, at nighttime or, or, you know, on their free time to get that first network and that level of, uh, that, also that level of education and experience. But I think if you approach relationships one uh, as a relationship, not as an opportunity or a business, but like, hey, this is a person right. doing something that they care about, uh, working in a field that we all care about, right? Because uh, fundamentally, gaming and esports as a as a subset of gaming uh, is made up of people that really love this industry and are so vocal to outsider and and toxic to outsiders, right? That's kind of the funny thing that I think a lot of sponsors and, and marketing firms, well, an issue that they have, right, uh, is is our community will let you know what they appreciate <laughs> and what they don't. Sure so will. so I think, yeah, yeah <laughs> check, check Reddit, exactly. So I think you got to come into it, one, with that uh, intent of how can I help, uh, two, knowing that this isn't a place to capitalize on some opportunity, it's a place to fulfill your passion and to do things that don't feel like work. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, it really is truly subjective, unfortunately. But but I think if you have those two uh, those two things in mind, that, that that'll get you quite far. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I was uh, really humbled uh, a few months ago. I saw some sort of poll on Twitter and they basically said, you know, uh, tell us if you make any money in esports or how much of your income you make in esports and this sort of a thing. And, you know we here are very fortunate to make money in esports in this this community this industry that we love and there were so many comments of these people who were just begging you know like oh if i could work in gaming if i could work in esports it would just be my dream this that and the other i had a very unique opportunity i started as head of partnerships at gamestop my first day they said we want you to figure out esports for us <laughs> and so that's not really something that we can replicate it right that's kind of right place right time i do tell people a lot of times volunteer volunteer mm -hmm. go to an event for uh the the weekend uh, after this recording is the first call of duty major here in dallas and um i always say if you volunteer you're gonna you're going to meet people. You're going to develop relationships. That's what all business comes down to is relationships. For young people who don't have a lot of experience, you might find out what you think you want to do sucks <laughs> the day to day. Or you might find something that you didn't even know was a job like social media manager. Yes, you can be on Twitter mm -hmm. all day and interact and people will pay you to do that if you're great at it. Paul, um, whether it's whether you agree with the volunteering uh, strategy or if there's another that you've seen successful, what is your opinion on how people can get into the space? John, I think your advice is spot on. I think, um, you know, like with anything, when you're, you're trying to break into a, an industry that's in high demand, right? There's, yes, a lot of people are hiring, but there's also a lot of people who want to work in the space. It's all about how do you go that extra mile and separate yourself from the other guy that's looking for a job or the other girl that's looking for a job. And, you know, uh, Jimmy's the perfect example with, with me, at least, you know, the, I get emails every day of people who want to come work in esports, mm -hmm. but Jimmy kept at it literally for years. Right. And, and yeah. fostered the relationship and showed that he could add value. And, and I, there's, there's no secret here, right? Volunteer show that you can add value, show that you're useful, um, be willing to learn and, and, you know, motivated and excited and, if you go that, if you do 10% more than the next guy, you'll get the, you'll, you know, you'll get the job, you'll break in. Um, so I think it's good advice. Uh, the other thing is just to me, it's, uh, you know, network, network, right. All the time. Yeah. And there's no substitute for, like you said, showing up at an event, maybe volunteering for an event and making sure you meet every single person there. Because one thing people massively underestimate is you don't know where opportunity is going to come from. You may mm -hmm. think you have a plan. You may think, you know, you've got it figured out, you know exactly what you want to do. You want to go work at Riot in social media or whatever it is. But I, right. I find more often than not, you know, there's a, an old expression, we make plans and God laughs. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, you don't know where those opportunities are going to come from. Maybe a conversation you had with someone two years ago and they remembered you for some reason and, 
you know, the way things happen and the way the universe sort of uh, plays itself out, I find never is according to plan. So like massive amounts of networking and talking to people and planting seeds for the long term without any expectation in the in the very short term. Yeah. And, you know, in this space, too, there's so many different disciplines, right? It's it's not dissimilar to traditional sports, but I think there's actually more uh, positions when you add the whole game development side of everything. But if you're in marketing, especially partnerships, my goodness, the number one uh, revenue stream currently in the space, which is volatile, I'm sure we'll get into some of that in a little bit. But um, it's like, no matter what you do, no matter, you know, we've got a lawyer here, we've got a VC guy here, I'm a marketing guy. And we all work in this space because this space supports so many different disciplines. Uh, I want to get into some of the esports side of everything. Uh, I've been excited for this co- conversation, Paul. I've heard you have some strong opinions. Cannot confirm. Uh, <laughs> that, that sounds very unlike me. Very <laughs> unlike me. I'm 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 usually a fence sitter kind of guy. Yeah, that's 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 the <laughs> reputation. Uh, and Jimmy, really interested to bring you in on some of this uh, as well. Um, first of all, let's just start out. What's what's working in the space? I'd love to look at some optimism. Um, I think uh, we are very similar from the standpoint where we, you know, I like to poke holes looking at the space, but I also love to fill those holes up with, you know, solutions. Um, you know, I'd also love to start off with, hey, what is great about the esports space? What is working? What needs to continue? And then let's get into some of these things that can use some improvement. Uh, Paul, I'll start with you. Um, you know, first of all, I, I just let me start with, I hate the distinction between esports and gaming. Like okay. I, I just, in, in the terms themselves, and I've said this many times publicly on the podcast at conferences, like if you and I go play basketball, uh-huh. you know, in Manhattan here and at a, you know, uh, just the two of us, are yeah. we playing a sport? So this is what I would say. I, I, I compare, um, well, Let's see. I would say if you're if you're doing a dunk contest, are you playing basketball? Yes, I think you are. My point is, I don't think there should be a distinction. Okay. I know there is, and yep. and I accept the distinction. I don't like it, but I accept it. And and I think esports, you know, I compare it to the iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg that everyone yeah. sees. It gets all the attention, all the hype. But I think the real opportunity is sort of the broader gaming market that sits under the water. I agree. Yes. If we're talking about esports itself, strict esports, right? Like professionals on a stage with an audience, the the, the definition yeah. most people use. The prof- I like to say the professional level of competitive gaming. That's my definition for esports. And then there's that's a microcosm compared to the non-competitive, much broader gaming ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think that will always be a relatively niche market, right? Yeah. It's not it's not going to be a trillion dollar industry. It's going to be uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars and it'll be, there'll be lots of hype and lots of attention around it. And it, that's the purpose it serves to draw attention to gaming. Yeah. But I don't ever think it, it's going to be the cash machine that's going to generate wealth for, you know, hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people around the world. So like if we set that expectation, then the conversation changes a bit, right? Because then I, I my criticism of like esports teams gets tempered a little bit because I go, "Ah, okay, it's not so like, these don't need to be $10 billion companies. The, the, if they just break even, if they manage to get to that point, we'll call that a success because it helps the ecosystem, the broader gaming ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. I I think my criticism of most esports proper companies is just allowing the hype to get ahead of just what is good business. Right. Mm. And I think part of that comes down to just inexperience. Yeah. A lot of gaming or a lot of esports has been built on the backs of gamers who are very enthusiastic about the space. And that counts for a lot, but may never have built a business before. And I think right. the, the teams and the companies that will succeed. And, and my advice is always, you know, get someone with maybe a little bit of grayer hair in the room. They don't doesn't doesn't need to be a white head of hair, but you know, a little bit grayer hair in the room sure. with someone who's maybe built a business before, because there's no substitute in my mind for that experience and those basics. Like I there's agree. nothing special about an esports business 
versus any other business. The basics still apply, the principles still apply. And I think that's what the industry needs more of. Yeah, you know, that's actually the the entire basis for the Esports Trade Association where I'm the board chair. You guys were uh, in attendance and participated uh, in our last conference. And, you know, our whole thing there is you got two groups of people who can't talk to each other. You've got gamers, like we are saying earlier, understand gaming, culture, etc. Just not a lot of professional business experience. It's not a terrible thing. It's just a fact of reality. And then you have typically uh, you have these professional business experts who have done business 20, 30 years who just don't get gaming. And the unique thing about esports opposed to traditional sports or traditional industries essentially is usually the professionals who have all this experience can teach the younger people because they can speak to them. But they just you know, you're starting out, I don't understand why people watch other people play video games. And then you go from, you know, okay, it's a little bit of a complicated structure uh, as far as like, how does an org have all these teams? And then you have content creators. It's just very unique compared to what they're used to. ESTA serves as this bridge of two groups of people who need each other, but struggle to communicate. And so I think we're definitely on the, the same page there. Uh, Jimmy, uh, one thing that I see in the space that I think is extremely positive is that gamers are innovators. You know, if you look at who has innovated how content is being consumed, it's gamers, right? We've been streaming forever. And now Disney+, Plus, CNN+, Plus, everybody is going to a streaming platform. What are some other things that you see that are the positives in the space um, that we should replicate and embrace? You know, in that same light, um, that, that's... <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, again, John's asking the tough ones today, I think, and, <laughs> and the ones where we could turn this literally into an all day affair with a giant panel and, and really break down these issues. So let me do my best to keep it concise. Um, but, you know, the, the example of gamers being innovators, particularly with streaming, right? That's that's an extension, I think, of what the audience, what the gaming audience wanted. And I think now as we see other streaming platforms following suit, what we're, what we're knowing or learning, right, is that all audiences want that. They want that connectivity. They want that interaction with, yeah. uh, with their heroes, with their stars, with their entertainers. So, um, you know, f fundamentally, I think you need to look at what audiences want, what crowds, groups of people, the fans, the followers, what have you, all of these different terms for really what is a group of any interested person in that content or in that industry and find out what they want. Um, and, and again, you know, they want live events. They want to talk with, uh, with who they're fans of. They want responses, but just as importantly, you know, I, when I was growing social media pages in, in gaming and in esports, if we didn't respond to comments on our, on our, uh, Instagram pages within the day, we, had, we were losing followers or had people just lashing out, kind of just saying we're too good, you know? Um, so, so they, it's funny and i don't know if that's an audience at large thing or maybe a gen z thing um but some of the things that we're noticing like i said are just wanting to be a part of something i think everyone wants to be accepted at some stage in their lives and i think everyone wants to feel like they're doing something that contributes to a larger movement and fortunately also today a lot of that aligns with social good and with movements that uh that are you know not just um economic in nature, but that have some type of uh, greater purpose to advance underrepresented voices and people or, or charitable causes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, innovation at its core, which was the root of your question, I think that alone uh, comes from really just being part of this community where, like I said earlier, where we are so vocal as to the things that we don't like or don't appreciate, but we're also incredibly supportive of those that we, of those that gamers do like and appreciate. Yeah, I, I think you made a great point there. That I'll take your two uh, points there, your last one first, which is the social good. One thing that I really love about this space is, you know, our industry has issues like everybody else, right? We're, we're working to uh, support underrepresented groups in a better way. We're trying to, you know, women, minorities, uh, et cetera. But, you know, in the, a lot of these traditional industries, it's like, this is how we've always done it this way or you just push things to the back burner. I give our industry a lot of credit that, yeah, there's shortcomings, but the things that need to be helped are greatly addressed. And there's a loud voice. Maybe part of that 
is because the community is so vocal and has the, their digital natives, right? They have the ability and the understanding to make their voice heard on Twitter, on Instagram, on Discord, Twitch, etc. The other thing which I think is connected, a uh, great point you made, Jimmy, is the content piece. You said gamers are making content in the ways that they're consuming it themselves. And so one of the things that I love too about esports is we can be a change agent. You know, a lot of times with like NCAA is finally getting around to name image likeness, but for years, right? It's been like, no, this is the way we've always done it. Well, for better or for worse, esports hasn't done much for a long time because <laughs> it's pretty new. And so we can come in and say, hey, we're doing this new. We're doing it by us, for us. So yeah, we don't have uh, league operators and team owners who are trying to do traditional TV deals. Why? Because that's not how we consume content. We're, you know, we're streaming on Twitch. You know, we're, uh, we're on Discord, etc. We're on Twitter. Um, I think that's just a great point that it's, a, it's such a bias for us community. And that uh, really helps us innovate, um, creates tons of engagement with youth. But then those professional business experts, the complementary experts, I like to call them, kind of are left out because they're stuck in that uh, traditional way of consuming content and things of that nature. Um, John, but just on that point, though, yes. like part of the problem with esports proper, uh, another big criticism I have is related exactly to this. It's to me, there's a severe lack of innovation because mm. esports continues to tether itself tra to traditional sports and traditional media. Okay. Right? Like the, the Activision Blizzard leagues are the perfect example. Why, do, why did we need city based leagues? <laughs> it never made sense with a digital product that was fundamentally global, that, you know, d d you don't need a stadium in your hometown. Uh -huh. It was just none of it made sense other than the fact that it felt comfortable because it's something we've done before. But comfort is the enemy of innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think esports needs to get out of this cycle of, well, it works for traditional sports or the sponsors understand this or we're mm -hmm. comfortable with this model and, and really go out on a limb and try new things. It's the only way that this thing moves forward. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that. I love this uh, love this conversation. I'm a big fan of the local, geographically located teams, personally. Um, with my experience at GameStop, I worked with a lot of the Overwatch League teams. That was when the, the league emerged, and I worked for a lot of them. And uh, one of the examples is through sponsorship. And I know it's not all about the sponsors, but sponsors are funding a lot in this space. The other is the, uh, the loyalty. So I'll touch on a couple of these, and I, I want to get your feedback, uh, Paul and Jimmy, too, if you have thoughts. Um, first of all, I remember uh, an announcement when HEB, the grocery store in Houston, announced that they were sponsoring the Houston Outlaws. And I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be brutal on Twitter. You know, these guys are going to get destroyed at a grocery store. Well, guess what? Everybody in Houston loves HEB because it's awesome. And so for a, sp for a local sponsor outside of geographically located teams, if HEB doesn't have a play in esports, a local company, only a national or preferably a global company has a sponsorship play in esports because there's nothing to tie it to locally. The other thing is with the, the team loyalty. So I'm a San Francisco 49ers fan because I grew up in California. I'm a San Francisco Giants fan because I grew up in California. I now live in Dallas. I've lived all over the country. And so uh, when my Niners beat the Cowboys here in Dallas in the playoffs, I uh, I was very gleeful, you could say. Um, I think that there is a big uh, unbalance between loyalty for players and loyalty for teams. And teams have it worse in the esports space. And so if I'm a popular pro and I've got 2 million followers and my team's trying to get me to do stuff, I'm going to say, you know what? I think I'm going to go to another team and I'm going to take my 2 million followers with me. And now this team has 2 million fewer followers to sell sponsorship against or to sell merch to or to bring to their events, etc. So I think, and so I want to open it up here for you, Paul. Those are my points on why I think um, it makes sense for those leagues. And I think there's a balance of being innovative, but also applying best practices when needed. What's kind of your take on that? 
There, there are decent counter arguments, um, John, and I've, you know, I've heard them before. Um, I, I don't, I don't believe in that balance though. Like I, I fundamentally believe the product's different. And so how we have to treat it is different. There's no best practices for esports because no one's figured it out yet. Had we, if we had figured it out, right. If traditional sports was the answer, every esports team would be rolling in cash and they're not right. They're right, almost all, all losing money. Um, exactly. And so something's wrong. And, and so the, let me start with the loyalty argument because I think that's probably the strongest counter argument, right? Okay. Um, I live in New York. I'm automatically a Rangers fan and a Giants fan and whatever else. Sure. Here's, here's the problem, right? Of the sports you mentioned in San Francisco, John, which is the one that you're the least a fan of? That you, that it's a sport maybe you don't care about. Yeah, I would say probably the San Jose Sharks because I'm okay. not a, So you're not a hockey fan, I'm right? I'm a hockey guy. Yeah, I do okay. love going to games in person. But uh, I'm not watching on TV. I'll say that. But would you spend money on a sport you're not really a fan of just because you live in that city? Um, I would be more likely to if I had a team in my city than if I didn't have a team in my city. Fair, but you probably still wouldn't, right? And I think the point I'm making is the, the challenge is not getting esports fans to come to events, right? Mm -hmm. Esports fans will come to events. The challenge is how do I take someone who's not an esports fan, right? Who, sure. who maybe doesn't play Overwatch, doesn't play Call of Duty, because if we're going to always just stick to the player base of these games and the hardcore esports fans, this will always be a really small industry. Yeah. And so how do I get someone who couldn't care less to come? My, my simple view is being living in that city doesn't, doesn't get you over that hurdle, right? Uh -huh. it, it, it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't get you over that hurdle. What it does do is it really hurts the size potential of that esports team, right? The Houston Outlaws will never have a market beyond Houston. And, sure. and I think when you have a digital product, you're leaving a lot of dollars on the table. Now, the, with the sponsor activation, I think that's also a good point. But I do think that, you know, global brands like a phase like a hundred thieves, like a cloud nine, right. That aren't tied to a city necessarily. Although I know they do own some, yeah. you know, they do own teams in those, in those franchise leagues can still activate locally without a locally franchise team. Mm -hmm. Right. I do think there's a way for those teams to smartly intelligently activate with local events. Right. And, and maybe, maybe you play show matches here or there, maybe you, whatever it is, right. There's ways to activate, I think, those local markets without limiting yourself to those local markets. Mm -hmm. And I, I always felt like a completely forced limitation. And, and the, the reason they forced it is not for loyalty. It's not for local sponsorship. The reason it was forced was so Activision Blizzard could sell franchise slots to sure. traditional sports owners, right? Because they knew these people don't know esports if I sell them something that looks and feels like what they already know, they'll buy it. They'll pay millions of dollars for this. And that was the pitch. Sure. Don't you want to own something that's going to be worth hundreds of millions yeah. or billions like Pennies your sports dollar, team, right? right? That's it. And so this was a, this was a strategy based on a developer, a publisher selling something, not strategy based on, we want to make sure these esports teams thrive and grow and are as big and successful as possible. And I think that's my concern. Interesting. Yeah, I, I personally, I love the the uh, the mix of the org with the local team. You know, like you talked about, you know, FaZe, Envy is one, 100 Thieves is one. And what's really interesting um, is <laughs> I kind of feel like esports orgs have competitive teams just to have the excuse to say, I'm esports, and then you make your money with your content creators because then you have an audience to sell sponsorship against. And that's a... That's a whole nother road we could go down. Um, but I, I love the the uh, variety of perspectives here. One thing I do want to get into, and I, I know we, uh, we could, we're podcasters, so we could talk for a very long time. So I want to make <laughs> sure we, we get this one in, is the opportunities. I think this is a unique topic that you guys both have some insight in. Um, two, two categories of opportunities I have here. Uh, where are opportunities for improvement? I think we could go for days on that one. But also, what are some un opportunities that are untapped? Where's the untapped potential that we haven't yet seen it uh, 
but uh, if we really uh, engage, we could we could improve the space in that regard. Uh, Jimmy, why don't we start off with you? Sure. Um, I, I need to be careful now because I don't want to give up too much as far as untapped potential goes because that might shed light on our strategy and I think what's going to make us different <laughs> and really accelerate our business. Um, you know, what, what I could share, I suppose, from my first years in 2017, 2018, 2019 transitioning uh, and doing a lot of consulting work for a number of tier one orgs was the amount of missed potential. You know, back then, Gen G didn't have a clothing line. Uh, we had other orgs that were really focused on tournaments and not on community or content. I think it was, and, and to, I, I think, repeat some of the themes from the conversation we've been having today, you know, it's a, it was a new industry. People were trying to figure out their pathway to success. There were a mixture of young kids that fell into a very successful brand and career by virtue of just gaming and being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And then you had a combination of them along with really great business leaders that had made a name for themselves in other industries, but didn't get gaming yet. Yeah. Didn't understand why this game was important, why this region was important or how to approach or navigate those waters. Um, so as far as what could be doing better, again, a subjective question to if you're looking at a talent representation firm or content creator versus an org and a team. Um, but but it really comes down to a lot of these businesses failing to monetize or show that they're doing it right. You can't just burn through investor cash for four or five years. Right. You have to yeah. eventually do something. Um, and I think hopefully we can all agree with that. I see Paul staring, so I don't want to draw, encourage his wrath. Um, <laughs> as far as as far as um, what's being done right, um, I think community is, is is great. You know, we're listening to community. We're growing in line. I, that was part of my previous answer. I think we're we're listening to our audience pretty well and and growing with them, giving, you know, listening to what they want, what they don't want. Um, and also at times telling them what they need to know or what they need to want. Or, you know, I, I did quite a bit of work uh, also in traditional entertainment. And it's funny because so much of music is really telling the masses what's cool, right? It's not yeah, putting out something sure. and seeing if they vibe with it. It's actually saying, hey, this is the next wave and you need to get on it. Right. So um, I think community is going pretty well. But yeah, as far as what isn't going well, I think it's really just a lot of businesses that haven't quite pivoted or that have are really, for, for lack of a better word, or, you know, I just can't really say it eloquently. A lot of companies are messing it up and it reflects poorly on all of us when they don't acknowledge that sooner than later and fix what they're doing or, or restructure or, you know, take that data and, and pivot that software or, you know, apply yeah. it to any industry, honestly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, I definitely echo that uh, last sentiment. Uh, you know, when I first started at GameStop, you know, this was years ago, uh, all these agencies, all these brands were coming up to me like, oh, eSports, I got to know about it. I got to get into it. How do I do it? Blah, blah, blah. Just a year later, after those initial conversations, it was already, hey, I've kind of heard this isn't really what, you know, this isn't the silver bullet that we were sold sort of a thing. And I think, I think a big part of that, uh, you know, one of my improvements would be data. Uh, would be reporting back. Uh, that's one where I think those uh, business practices definitely can be applied. We have a lot of traditional sports teams who have people who are very, very smart, very experienced at uh, uh, fulfilling sponsorships. You know, once you once you get that uh, press release on the Esports Observer, then you got to go to work and fulfill that partnership and report back the ROI that you're driving. Uh, Paul, uh, what are some improvements in your mind and what are some un tapped potentials that you can share that did not give away any uh, secrets that we're not allowed to know yet. <laughs> I mean, there's the most obvious opportunity because I think content's a massive opportunity. Content, I've seen multiple industry life cycles over the last two decades, right? Like trends in tech broadly and things like that that come and go. The one thing that has stayed almost, um, you know, has been a no brainer for every life cycle is content's always king. And I think- yep there's a massive, massive demand for content in the gaming and esports space and very, very little good supply, to be honest. So I think there's a huge gap and a massive opportunity there. And obviously that's, 
you know, one of the, the opportunities that we are going after. Um, so I'm obviously very, very bullish there. I, I think really quick, really quick. I want to yeah. dig in a little deeper on that one because yeah. people who may not be as familiar, you know, we've talked about Venn at a, at a high level surface level earlier in this and people who aren't as deeply knowledgeable at the space might say, Paul, you're saying content is king and this is something that's always going to work and we need more of it. We need, but why did something like Venn fail? Uh, I mean, <laughs> we, could, we did we did a whole podcast just on that, just to be clear. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons maybe not relevant to this conversation. Like if you raise $50 million and you blow through it in nine months, chances are you're probably mismanaging your business and it doesn't matter how good the content is. Not a you sign haven't, of success. Yeah, I feel like. Well, you haven't, like part of the secret to success in startups is good luck, right? Eventually, mm -hmm everyone gets a bout of good luck. Everyone gets, you know, lightning strikes. And, and, and the, the key is two things. One to survive long enough for that good luck to happen. So that was Venn's big mistake, right? They didn't give themselves the runway, the ability to be successful when you're burning cash that aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, and two, be in a position to capitalize on that good luck when it happens. Like to me, that's, that's 80% of the secret of success with startups. Um, so I, I think part of it was just their their lack of business expertise in managing the finances of their business. I think the other part of it was a lack of oversight from investors and things like that who let them, you know, who let uh, them run this like that. But I think the third part may be most relevant to this topic is they they went <laughs> and I made this argument and I think people look at me funny when I make it. it you can be so authentic. Mm -hmm that it's no longer authentic, right? There's like an extreme of authenticity okay. where it, it's no longer authentic. And what I mean by that, it's like they tried so hard to be like mm. hip with gamers. Yeah. That it was, it, it was no longer authentic. It became authentic. hello fellow kids sort of a thing. Yes, right. Like, but it was not, not that bad. And yeah. it was just, yeah. it, it, even gamers cringed because it's like now authenticity becomes like pandering yeah. and, and, and gamers don't want that. Right. No audience wants that. I, I want to say, I want to add John to, and without saying too much, cause I was actually in, in uh, a, a level of discussions and negotiations with Venn when they were in business about mm -hmm. reaching some of the talent that I was representing some uh, traditional musicians and performers. And just to Paul's earlier point about mismanagement of funds, you wouldn't believe the money that they were just throwing at us just to have this talent affiliated for a half hour program. Wow. And, um, you know, the, the kind of thing that could keep a lot of businesses running for a long time and they're just offering it as appearance fees. So uh, I just wanted to say personal experience with that as well. Yeah, you can't always th just make something work because you throw a lot of money at it is what I'm hearing. Um, but but what I was going to build on Sorry, with you, ahead. Paul, really quick was yep. uh, I always say, you know, if you're saying we need to be authentic, you're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Authenticity <laughs> isn't a strategy. It's uh, it's just being. It's a state of being, right? Like, yeah, just do you. And if you're trying to be, uh, yeah, I could say that a million different well, ways. So I'll hand it it's back like over to you. It's, people listen to our podcast, right? And think. I'm putting on some kind of character with the prophet, right? The people who know me know that okay, for better for worse is how he is all the time. <laughs> maybe it's turned up 10% for the podcast, but it's sure. for the most part, it's me, right? There's, there's no, it's yeah. not a different Paul that goes, you know, when I'm, when we're off the air, it just doesn't work like that. And I think, yeah, yeah it, it was just this weird approach to content that didn't work. But it brings me to sort of the second opportunity, which I think is monetization of content there needs to be innovation and how you, mm. how you layer content with other things, technologies, other products, other services, and what that stack looks like on top of content is where I think we'll see lots of innovation and lots of interesting opportunities come up. Yeah, that was my next question was the type of content, right? Because what I'm hearing with Venn is it's not necessarily the type of content, it was, it was the approach. Um, we talked about the authenticity thing, but if you're, you know, if money is no object, it <laughs> quickly becomes a problem because you ran out of it. And, um, you know, I, I always think as far as where are you consuming it? Uh, currently it's mobile, right? Everybody's on their phone. Um, I watch some stuff on my laptop, but when I'm on my laptop, I'm typically working 
every kid has a phone if you're optimizing that uh that content for mobile that seems to me to be the the best place to do it would you add to to any of that or disagree um i mean i definitely don't disagree with any of that john i think one of the things we learned which is interesting is you know a, a large majority of our audience a very large majority of our audience still listens to our content in audio form even though we put out almost everything in video yeah. a lot of it's consumed in audio and i think it's because a lot of our audience are, you know, professionals and maybe they're doing other things or they're commuting or they're working out or right? like they're busy right? and that's it. And I'm always, uh, that always surprises me, you know, when you, when you realize how good looking Jimmy and I are, right. And then <laughs> and how much they're missing out. Same by with not... me, man. I, I got the same <laughs> issue. I don't get it either. <laughs> um, but, but I also think it's just like r- repurposing or, 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 creating content specific to the audience and platform. So like with business of esports, there's very, very clear direction in terms of what makes the cut as content we put out. It has to educate, it has to entertain, and it has to come from a place of authority. If it doesn't meet those three criteria, it doesn't go out. Um, and, and that may be different from, you know, a one minute video we put out on Snapchat or TikTok or wherever, right? That's, that doesn't need to, uh, necessarily educate, like, you know what I mean? Like the criteria for that audience may be different, but we're always thinking about who's, who's actually consuming this. Yeah. That's a great point. Uh, I love the content specific to platform. That's something, you know, just on social media alone, right? You've got certain things that perform on, uh, LinkedIn, uh, you know, Instagram is very visually focused. Uh, Twitter is very much the update. Um, and I don't think anybody uses Facebook anymore. So, (laughs) Um, I want to, with about 10 minutes left here, uh, I want to give you an opportunity for two things. Uh, the, the last thing I want to ask you is, you know, how can people follow you? But before that, uh, Jimmy, I want to get your, your thought here. I know Paul's the prophet, you know, but, uh, I want to hear from you as well. This time next year, 2023, today is March 1st. What are some of the big news items or the major topics of esports what is your prediction a year from now oh great um yeah 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 we 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 talk about this quite a bit actually uh internally on uh i don't know when you're in the business of of news and current events right you you see trends but it's also fun to kind of speculate and that's a lot of what we talk about on our show and in our programming not just on the business of esports but on our our wednesday night live show where we really get into all of those news and headlines um and it's always fun right because the whole point of that is putting on your tinfoil hat and trying to assume or think about what did that company decide or you know what 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 was the discussion that led to that announcement to that merger to that raise etc um and and then you kind of hopefully piece together some trends i used to have a running list of some things because as you can imagine we take a lot of uh bold predictions and it's nice when you're right you know um like what what, one of the ones that i had uh tried to predict was a major advancement in the use of uh, royalty free or copyright free music and we saw amazon make a big announcement uh, about a month ago kind of supporting uh, with the with their music catalog and library supporting streamers using uh, uh, at least a limited uh, book of music mm-hmm. and that came a lot sooner than I expected honestly because I've known all the hurdles there I would say one of the things we're going to see is another esports org going public by this time next year um, not just phases one billion dollar um, SPAC but you know for example, when you're a hundred thieves and you're raising that much capital and, and we've seen how fast they burn through it. More importantly, there's only a few uh, more times they, I think that they could do something like that before they have to rely on, on other sources of, of investment. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw, uh, yeah, I saw a tier one org of the hundred thief sides that, that announces an intent to go public. Now, do you um, have a, uh, any speculation on who, that will be or is that is that a little too deep for the the tinfoil hat um you know w- when i manifest things i like to keep it broader because okay. it increases my chance of being right <laughs> smart <laughs> smart but um but it would be one of the top uh, one of the top five to top seven listed uh esports orgs any year on the forbes ranking yeah, right. so um so it has I would to be say, 100 thieves uh, has to it, be has, it really has to be 100 thieves That's but i was trying to throw in maybe maybe a cloud nine in there i don't know uh, maybe a t well 
I don't know about TSM, but yeah, I, I think we're, we're all kind of leaning internally that we think Hundred Thieves is going to go public by next year. All right, you hear, you heard it here first, or maybe you heard it here second uh, after listening to the East <laughs> the Business of Esports podcast, uh, Paul. What are some of your uh, big predictions, major news, major topics this time for 2023? I can tell you things I'd like to see. I don't know if, the, I don't know if they, they, they'll actually happen. Give me a couple of both. Uh, Give me a couple of uh, you'd like and a couple of we will. I, I like what's going on around, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a bit broader, not just esports specific. Um, I definitely think we're going to continue to see uh, m and heat up around game publishers that's not going to slow down over the next year right like we're still going to be talking about that a year from now there's still you know ea still in play the uh, ubisoft still in play right there are still big publishers that could be bought out yeah. um and i think this uh that space becomes increasingly competitive we see eve ever increasing valuations there like all of that is going to continue to heat up um one of the things i'd like to see and i made you know, in January 2019, I wrote a list of predictions. Uh, I wrote a blog post that were sort of my predictions uh, for 2019. So this would be three years ago now. Okay. And um, the, the the way I framed that that article was I said, everyone's wrong about predictions and, and esports in 2019, <laughs> right? And, I bet and, everybody agreed with that. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the things, like I, I go back to the article and and, you know, I, everyone thought cloud gaming was going to be a huge business in 2019. And I said, wrong, not going to happen, right? Cloud gaming, we're 2022, still not a huge business, yep. still not going to be a huge business in 2023, right? Uh, one of the predictions everyone thought Fortnite's going to dominate the esports scene. That was all everyone talked about in 2019. I said, that's wrong, never going to happen. 2022, Fortnite's still not going to dominate the esports scene. All right. Um, what will dominate the esports scene? You know, I think the Activision Blizzard leagues will continue to struggle. Um, I I would not be shocked if they get shut down completely. Like I I, I think that's um, the, I don't think they survive as is. Maybe Microsoft spins them out in a different sort of way with a different look and feel. But as is, it's not sustainable. It's not it's not a product that um, can 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 survive long term. Okay. I think um, Rocket League. You know, Rocket League is an interesting one. Uh, I don't think it'll ever have mass market. Like, I don't think it'll ever be as big as football or, you know, like it's not going to have that kind of size or scale. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's interesting. I think, you know, the irony is Epic has most of the high potential, whether it's in esports or just in sort of a bigger metaverse play, whether it's yeah. intersecting other things like music and movies there's no platform, I think, maybe other than Roblox that has as much potential as Epic. And there's no company blundering it more completely than Epic. Right? They're, just, <laughs> um, okay. they're just handing the win to Roblox. So if you want my prediction, 2023, Roblox is going to continue on this sort of massive growth spree. Um, like uh, w they will lead the way in anything metaverse activation they're going to start aging up so their users will have this sort of larger demographic, not the typical, you know, just 13 to 18 year olds. Um, yeah. You know, uh, that would be one of my big predictions. I think this, the other big one that no one's talking about is uh, the where the Middle East falls in sort of the grand scheme of the gaming industry. Yeah, everyone the talks ESL about announcement recently. Yeah. Everyone talks about China. Everyone talks about India. Everyone talks about Korea. I think those are probably all the worst places to be investing in. If you're looking at the gaming space, uh, the Middle East has a young demographic. They're digital savvy and they have a ton of disposable income, which you don't find in Asia. Um, you know, well, everyone is ignoring sort of that sleeping giant there. And then when they wake up, like you saw with uh, this, those Saudi acquisitions of ESL and face it, they, they can spend big dollars to build an ecosystem if they want it. Um, right. that, that to me is one of those huge uh, trends that I think we'll be talking about next year. Yeah, that's really interesting. My uh, vantage point working with PRG, which is the world's largest entertainment, entertainment production company producing all these big music festivals and live event tours. We've seen a ton of entertainment being produced in Middle East. So yeah, that, that trend definitely uh, makes sense for me. Uh, lastly, before we let you go, uh, how can people listen, get involved with the Business of Esports podcast, the other things that you're doing, and how can they follow you guys individually? 
Yeah, I think uh, so with the business of esports, definitely check out the business of esports.com. All of our contents there. You can also subscribe to the business of esports anywhere you get podcasts uh, or on YouTube. You can follow business of esports on TikTok these days, Instagram, uh, Twitter, you name it. Like business of esports is on every social platform. Uh, I would also say Wednesday evenings at nine at sorry, 8 30 p.m. Eastern time. We do a live stream. It's like a, a new show where we cover the news. It's a bigger cast. Cool. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And we do it live every Wednesday evening at 8 30 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, and just check out our new podcasts. I would say I, I would love people's feedback on that. Uh, Meta business and Meta woman. You can subscribe to those on Spotify or Apple podcasts or Google play. And uh, remind people, obviously, to subscribe, John, to your podcast, because I think you're doing incredible work with, uh, with DLC here. And, uh, you know, the, the world needs great interviewers like you to, to sort of tease out what people know and what people are thinking. And so um, I, I appreciate the work you do here. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And then, Jimmy, uh, how can people get in touch with you as well? Yeah. Um, LinkedIn is usually the best way. Jimmy Barada uh, on LinkedIn. I think I have an open profile and I pretty much see everything that goes through there. So um, perfect. All, all business. <laughs> Great. Well, Paul, Jimmy, I so appreciate you guys. I've uh, really respected the content you've produced. I've learned a ton from you over the years. And so it's really a pleasure uh, for me to be able to share uh, some of that knowledge with my audience here. Um, and look forward to putting this out. So uh, thank you once again for joining me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Futuri Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.